Good afternoon all. This is our first session of our strategic case study for August 2016. So thank you for joining us, joining me in this class. Uh, we will have a two hour class today as well as tomorrow. Right. The weekend classes are from two to four and then we have some weekday classes as well. So what I will start off is with um, about the same structure then going into uh, the examiner's report then we will um, look into that area quite a bit you know what the examiner had to say about the previous exam as well and his comments and uh, we will go through uh, I think we might be able to go through 50% of our case study um, today. So what we will be doing is analyzing the case study and then we will uh, do a question as well. So what I'm very interested to do is at least uh, do two questions for a session and we will start today a little bit easy with at least just doing one question right because because it will give you uh, the ability and uh, the necessary skills as to how to answer the questions and the re this is the reason why i'm starting with the exam focus you know i'm looking at the end in mind first looking at you know what you should achieve at the exam looking at what the examiner has mentioned and then working backwards you know looking at a case study at the precinct looking at the industry top 10 issues the strategic analysis and so on and so forth so uh, that's the kind of structure i will put the structure in our dropbox as well saying these are the days that we will be covering uh, you know what topics we will be covering at in each session so we will have two lecturers taking your class uh, one will be myself, Andrew, uh, Andrew, and the other person will be Kuma. A quick question, Andrew. I'm just uh, wondering about the timing of the classes. You chose between 2 to 4 um, every weekend and every day of the weekend, so that really pretty much for the next one month kind of like cancels all our plans. I mean, you know, it's in the middle of the day. There's not much we can do with the families. Is there a reason for this particular timing? Yeah, it's the availability of uh, other people as well as the lecturers. And I would say to you that it's just a few weeks, four weeks. So at least focus these four weeks. I mean, you've got after that, you've got a lot of time on your hands, hopefully, uh, because it's going to be an intense four to five weeks. So I would recommend that you really focus on the case study in this exam because you need to do quite a bit of work by yourself as well. So attending the class is, in, is not sufficient. You need to do some, uh, some work on your own because um, as you know, the, the, we can't predict what type of questions that will be asked, but we, what we can do is give you more and more questions for practice, as well as then give you areas and articles to look into, read through. So for you to do all these activities, it is a bit difficult to have unfortunately have a social life as well as then you are also committed to work and then do the exam uh, so th it is this four to five weeks is really quite tight any other questions right so what we're gonna do is one second now somebody's right uh, what I'm going to do is share my screen with you. So um, we do not want any cameras 
so if you by accidentally have switched on the camera what I would request you to do is switch it off now for people who don't know me uh, I'm Andrew uh, I'm one of the lecturers I've uh, been lecturing for some time now and I'm happy to say I've also got um, a world prize winner with me uh, at the strategic level so that's that was a very proud moment for me uh, one of the things uh, that you know the success for this particular person the reason for the success was um, he did an enormous number of questions um, and that was the success purely and uh, the first time he did it, he got through and he got the world prize. So that that's that's really, uh, there is no shortcuts to it. Uh, attending the class as well as then doing a number of questions, right? That that is the clear um, direction that I would give you. Um, so we will go through. I've got a lot of experience in the project management, change management as well. Uh, so I will impart that knowledge to you. And um, IT systems, again, this is quite important in your uh, case study. We'll talk to you about that as well. Now, um, in your area, we need to focus on the four uh, competencies right now this is emphasized over and over again uh, by your examiner because uh, some of us are pretty good you know from a <clears throat> sorry technical skills numbers uh, that's pretty good but when it comes to business leadership people skills we forget it or we don't apply right and this again has become a point you know the examiner has marked it as you know where people have not actually focused on these areas so and also you need to be a bit more go into a bit more depth we'll come to it uh, in your in your uh, when we when we start looking at a question and an answer right so at this strategic level they're expecting you equally to apply these skills that's 25 percent each uh, for application and of course then you need to have your ethics now ethics the examiner has not been very happy with the way people have uh, applied the ethical principles and um, so this is something right so can everybody hear me well because one student has said my voice is breaking so i just want to find out swati can you hear me well can you hear you perfectly fine thank you um so uh, from the other side yeah okay okay mohammed thank you so uh, you may need to if you are not hearing me well that means something might be uh, wrong in your side so just try to fix that please um, make sure your camera is switched off then uh, it, it'll be fine thank you Prabin. Um, let us go into the four competency areas that they're talking about technical what are the technical aspects of it the financial statements when you look at investment appraisals so you will not be asked to do a investment appraisal but more of the analysis of it and interpretation of it um, and you're looking at the risk cycles the tara models uh, that is um, and then you look at corporate governance the controls and frauds now when we come into business we look at uh, the strategic um, models that we generally use. Uh, we look at the five forces, uh, the stakeholder models, right? It's not, or not enough for you to know the models. It's a case of application of these models into the answer. That is what is important. And you need to understand what sort of a... Um, a model strategic model that you will be using uh, depending on the case study given then of course the options that we've got as a company what are the options and in order to analyze the options you can use Porter and of BCG matrix and also the value chain right uh, human resource management 
uh, quality management balance scorecard will play a big role uh, SVA which shall the value analysis and of course our traditional controls such as the ratios and so on um, we look at the people again we have to look at the stakeholders this case study is uh, you'll have to consider uh, and look into the stakeholder analysis a lot and it's it's not only that the model per se which is quite easy uh, but it's a case of application in an appropriate manner right uh, then we look at um, we look at the structure uh, what sort of a structure that we've got and what are the pros and cons of this structure right uh, we look at uh, the culture of the company um, what is motivating certain people and ethics ethics will again play a significant role in this particular uh, case study right and leadership roles uh, and and the, the leadership required in this type of case is also quite significant because you can appreciate this is a this is in an industry which is very new right so your leadership skills are going to be tested because you're going to have different types of scenarios thrown in throwing being thrown at you right uh, if you look at something like um, like Airbnb for example very new concept right but you know the leadership skills were tested because you're coming into a new industry you know it's the technology but the way they offer the product is completely different so these products that we've got is also um, you know is quite different and uh, different new ways of thinking so your leadership skills have to be uh, very different and uh, quite dynamic it may change as well from um, one scenario to the other then uh, it's the same in this the following slides we're looking at what sort of business skills that we that a firm has to have so you look at um, fit in with the goals goals of the firm uh, what is the strategy of the company basically and based on the strategy we've got our goals right and does it fit with the goals uh, anything we need to look at the financial feasibility uh, economic feasibility uh, look at the share price look at the profit the cash flow as well as how it impacts your uh, social aspect of it that means uh, the um, the the stakeholders right and on the CSR um, we will also talk quite a bit on uh, uh, GRI so we'll come to that in an, in, a, in another class and you look at technology and timing so this is an industry where we use cutting-edge technology so uh, we will talk a lot about that and there are advantages disadvantages uh, in using this type of technology and how does it certain things impact the operations of the company um, the the business the the roles in the company right again since it's new again this type of thing it always keeps evolving uh, so there might be changes constant changes happening to the organization as well so how would this be um, embraced by the employees how should we communicate this and lead this kind of change uh, with our employees take our employees through this journey that's again a task and something that will get tested as well and people's skills will look at the stakeholders again ethical issues that that play um, competitor behavior uh, and then we go into the next section uh, more into leadership I will not spend a lot of time here um, there are different um, theories given as well 
um, and we may look into the team building aspect of it quite a bit because you will see that um, this company will not act alone it needs the collaboration of different parties so as a result the team building and how we work with um, with different stakeholders are quite important for our success um, more into leadership we look at the motivation and change leadership uh, areas then we look at um, what will motivate certain people certain stakeholders certain um, entities uh, because we need it's not a profit alone right so we need to understand profit or bottom line is not the only thing that will drive motivation um, and let's go to the next section here we go uh, models that we will use uh, you should be very familiar with these models because this um, knowing the model actually is guidance that that's all that it will give you it will give you a nice structure to say okay these are the key stakeholders they are high power high interest so how should we engage them right um, because the way you engage with a low power low interest stakeholder and a high power high interest stakeholder is completely different now if you um say the the characteristic the the ways of engagement with these stakeholders are kind of similar when you if you state that in a, in your answer right uh, the examiner is not going to pass you right even though you've mentioned the Mendeleev's matrix maybe you have drawn it or whatever uh, but still because he understands that you do not understand the concept of application right so this is where people go wrong and when there is something to do with stakeholders it does not mean that you have to write everything about the Mandelos matrix there again you lose marks examiner sees that you don't know how to use your time and fail you again right so if there is something to do with stakeholders find out what exactly are they asking about the stakeholders and is there a particular type of stakeholder they're talking about or should you bring in particular type of stakeholder should we b talk about um, you know a high power low interest stakeholder here because that's what the scenario is on about right and then you need to talk about how you engage that particular stakeholder that segment okay so it's not just knowing the um, knowing this model that will make you pass the exam it's the application itself and and another one that they talk about is the five force analysis uh, you you would be knowing uh, the five force analysis quite well uh, here again we look at from our standpoint our company uh, are they really um, you know the rivalry among the existing competitors how is it like right what is the threat of a new entrance right uh, and the bargaining power of our buyers the suppliers substitutes what are available what is out there right how will it impact our company and the change model uh, quite important uh, there are many change models uh, that's available so you can apply any of the change models but I find Lewin's change model quite easy to apply and that's the that's the one I have um, mentioned here as well and it, because it clearly shows you know if you want to change the behavior change uh, you know the behavior of people uh, due to a chain uh, due to a project or something new that you're bringing in how do you do it right um, basically unfreezing you move to the next stage which is moving to that next stage 
um, and then creating an environment for them to move and then once they are comfortable in that new state you you make it you refreeze it right so this is uh, a change model that can be used in the exam as well as even in your day-to-day -day life then we look at different leadership styles i will not go into uh, dwell in this too much um, when we come into questions answers we may uh, come across this then we will look into it and of course our pastel which is um, very topical in this particular case study right extremely topical and we will again there will there won't be a question that will be asked straight away on your pastel right but it's a case of uh, application of this into your case study and you may you may not need to talk about all of it but maybe for example the environment political right social factors maybe certain things that you want to talk about right not everything and then uh, the corporate governance plays a, a important role here and at the strategic level you are supposed to be quite familiar with this corporate governance how to govern the company uh, what is required um, you know it talk about different committees that should be there and uh, the remuneration and so on and so forth nomination committee it, it is um, again something at this level that the examiner expects you to know quite well uh, because because of what's happening in the corporate world there's a lot of frauds a lot of um, issues that's happening uh, that have been happening in the past few years as well so this is something that they really want uh, they examine you on this particular topic right and um, this is one of my favorite models the SAF S model because this is used for any type of investment and it again it gives an amazing structure for us to use in our answer so that you will not miss the points we will look at is it suitable right is it really this particular thing is, is project or investment is it suitable uh, and is does it link to our strategy is it feasible right is it practical and they look at will it get accepted by our stakeholders right and then we look at the sustainability of it as well so uh, this is a very good framework that you should be um, getting familiar with and you need to apply in your at your exam right and ends of matrix um, is a very good tool for you to look at strategic options where am i currently as a company where do i want to go in the future right well do i have the necessary resources currently or in the future and remember the type of uh, industry that we are in we require a significant amount of investment right so uh, for any new project that we are doing and again it is a new area so you need to um, immerse yourself in this particular industry and think as a person who's who's really into this alternate renewable energy and um, because you need to really embrace this this kind of uh, industry and and see why are people so interested in it why should we get into it why are people so interested in getting off the grid right and why are people and government supporting this quite a bit now um, so this is and then again looking at well 
if that support structure is there how can we grow the company right then uh, we spoke about ethics earlier uh, this will again play a significant role because there are quite a lot of dilemmas when it comes to renewable energy and uh, the reason is you will see countries embracing renewable energy in one side but also then you see the same countries going into uh, you know the normal energy the resources the, the traditional ones like oil and gas because they have it they have those deposits and then they exploit those as well so there is a lot of debate about it there are certain governments certain countries who are in this kind of dilemma and you will also see uh, companies going into renewable energy then also into uh, uh, this traditional oil and gas energy so a lot of things to debate about right uh, and there will be quite a few ethical points that we will come across now uh, risk is a very important area for us you can see now the examiner unlike those days a few couple of years ago I mean they are giving us a very clearly the SWOT analysis the risk analysis everything is given so basically it's more for you to understand interpret provide guidance and in give it in a more strategic sense so they don't want you to basically identify all this in the pre scene because they're giving it to you right so if they're giving everything like that the SWOT the risk analysis there is a lot more that that they're expecting from you so your standard of the answer should be at a much higher uh, level than than normal because now it's you don't have to spend time looking for these things right because it's already given to you right? um, we look at the risk uh, management style what um, the the cycle that's there SEMA uh, has their risk management cycle and you can use this again as a framework to apply and you will see you know different types of renewable energy may bring in quite a lot of uh, different types of risks as well okay and we especially going into R&D you know you have to spend a lot of money on R&D risks are so linked with that as well now uh, how do we respond to risks this is where we use the Tara model and um, the examiner has commented on this uh, the last time where you know examiner has mentioned you know people people do state the risks of a particular scenario but you know they don't really showcase how it, it should be mitigated right so that is you're basically answering just half the question right so examiner is saying well you should not be you you should not pass this because you're not you're not you're doing you're just answering half the question basically so the risks that they have given in this case would be uh, related to just the in the, the company but each scenario each project may have their own risks so please bear that in mind so each scenario each project may have different risks and then you need to look at how you will uh, use um, the Tara model and evaluate how to mitigate these risks yeah and of course there are the risk categories are there as well so you should be able to then go and identify one thing is look at the risks what are the potential risks where do how can I categorize them and then I look at the priority of it I should prioritize the risks as well and then look at mitigation strategies yeah and 
now we look at how we are going to analyze the pre scene uh, so at this point I want to get to you and uh, just ask some of you guys um, who has who has not read the pre scene as yet that's fine if you're not but I just want to find out because if if all of us are in in the same space or you've all done read the case or we've not read the case so because depending on your answer I will go more in depth okay Nikhil says not read anybody else thank you Nikhil anyone else okay okay thank you so right so i think we've got kind of 50 50 in this this case right and um what we will do in that case is go and read the case and analyze it together and you can see when you're looking at each page you just go and not only just read it but then see you know what more are they trying to say read between the lines that's what we need to do and see what models that we can use and we also look at our past exams as well right um, and we need to highlight what is important now what I would suggest it uh, suggest is that you guys um, as we go along uh, please do take notes um, and so that it is easier for you and then you can refer back as well I have saved um, the pre scene in the Dropbox but uh, you may ha you may want to have your own pre scene you want to make all different notes and things like that because I have made notes there myself and uh, we will do mock exams based on those the, the pre scene as well look at some of the scenarios that we can use right that comes to the end of our first section right now I want to talk to you about the examiner's view okay so let me stop sharing this for a second any questions so far okay right now let me share this again with you right so we are going to talk about uh, look at look at this AEN um, renewable energy um, so let us let us look at before we go into the case study I want to go through an area which is um, how will the results be presented okay so it is a scale score between 0 and 150 and they look at um, the four competencies strong moderate and fail uh, and they will give um, a strong moderate and fail grading for each of the competencies right and of course your overall grade will tell you whether you passed or failed this exam so how what do I need to do to pass the exam that means the score should be above 80 and you should have strong moderate grades in each of the competencies so that is a key point because if you have at times um, you may have mm. scored above uh, 80 but then the grading is not there okay so then that's a bit of a uh, that's a bit of a problem the competencies you've not scored well 
right and you you will have a problem there right um, so if you've not met that the threshold then again you will not pass the exam right and that's where you know you're in your sometimes you're you know in you've got high 70s and not been able to clear Be in this case it's it's the case of you know you're almost there but you have not done something right and something would be the competencies you've not elaborated maybe you've not answered every aspect that they're expecting you to answer uh, right uh, because you, sorry quick question on that yes. topic what do you mean like maybe the competencies have not been fully addressed do you like actually mean that in every question all four competencies that you mentioned earlier have to be present in each answer to be able to satisfy even like technical people skills in every single answer so what i would say is always look at whether you are able to apply all four first you know this is where the answer planning plays an important role right if you launch into an answer straight away this is another way of failing because you can't focus right um, you don't know exactly what they're asking in a question there might be multiple sections and we have i have seen this personally with students where they will answer only two parts and they will answer very well that two parts and they expect to pass they come out of the exam saying, oh, well, I did it very well. It was good, right? But actually not because there were three other parts you've not even touched, right? Here you will fail, okay? So be careful, answer to what the examiner is asking you to do, right? And see, and if you, you have to have, yes, where, what are my core compet four competencies? Can I apply them? You have to go on asking yourself these questions and focus on that, right? I know it's a difficult thing to do, but this is the way that you, if you plan the structure properly, then it is an easy thing to do right you need to structure your answers you need to plan your answers otherwise it is a very difficult uphill task yeah so if you have failed what's happened is well you have not achieved that strong or moderate grade and the integration right um so it didn't it sometimes it lacked the depth and breadth necessary this happens when we are running out of time okay if you're running out of time of course you know you're very sketchy in your answer you're gonna be very uh, restricted to what you have to say okay so be careful there now the next one um, what do the competency grades mean right so a strong is you have integrated pretty well it's quite good um, and demonstrated the business competency in this area right moderate now if you have this is the most difficult thing right because you've got a moderate and you have failed and you can't understand what's going on here right um, so the depth is not there you've not elaborated um, and also you have not skipped some of the um, answer questions and you answered only partially right so he's not able to give you more marks because you've answered partially right so he's saying yes what you answered is okay therefore it's moderate because out of five, you answered only three or two. The others you've not answered, right? And we will see this when you start doing your answer plans, right? You will see it for yourself. Um, so this is where the um, 
you know you're at the strategic level and what is the expectation is you know all in all four competencies uh, you see equally spread right um, now let us go to the answer what are they expecting have you interpreted the requirements correctly really have you inter because sometimes you give an answer to a completely different question right because this is what's in your mind so be very very careful i've seen this happening with students over and over again right they've answered a different question right answer all the requirements all the sets so when you're doing the answer plan point out okay what is what are the questions that he's asking in this one question right look at look out for those things and it will be in a in a paragraph okay they are not giving you very nicely point a this is the question point b there's another question they're not going to give it to you like that they'll give it to you in an email or paragraph you know fashion you need to basically extract it out right you need to bring in your theories and application right so you can't just like that answer something you need to say this is the theory behind it this is the reason why i'm saying you know uh, i'm going through that this particular direction right uh, you have to conform to the format if it's a report write a report if it's a if they're asking an email write an email format if it's a presentation in that particular format if they're asking for presentation don't give an email like in paragraphs just don't go on giving that type of um, answer because immediately uh, the examiner is thinking you know I've asked you something you've given me something else you've not actually understood what I wanted right short concise sentences with less punctuations why is this imagine if you're the examiner you're getting 50 to 60 100 uh, papers to correct yeah so when you have short concise um, sentences it's easy for you to read as the examiner and give marks now the next things that we're talking this the last um, bullet points are we are marketing ourselves okay this is what we are doing those bullet points are saying how to market yourself right if you don't make it nice for this person if you if you're putting your theories everything all over the place right the examiner it's a difficult task for the examiner to give marks to you now you have to make it easy for him to give you marks right the first bullet points we are talking about the technicality of the answer the sec the the latter part of the bullet points we're talking about how to market yourself and how to make it easy for the examiner to give you marks right so short paragraphs selective underline don't go on underlining everything he can't understand what is important right so he can't see that of course answer within time because if you if be careful here again five in one question he has asked five questions right equally divide the timing okay and then see how much you need to spend on each point you might come to point three and that's your favorite topic and you're gonna write for the rest of the 15 minutes about this particular topic now will you will you pass no you will not because you're not even touch the other two points or you've just given one liner to the other two points how can the examiner give you marks he can't give you marks right so this is again uh, an exam technique because remember be very strict with yourself time it move on move on from one point to the other time it and just move on as soon as you reach 60 minutes you will be pushed to the next question in the event you finish um, 10 minutes earlier 
and if you go to the next question please remember you will not get that extra 10 minutes again you will be marked for 60 minutes right so that you've lost that 10 minutes completely so don't think that you're gonna get additional 10 minutes right it's not like the traditional paper base exam where you save in one you save some time and then you can come back you cannot come back okay there is no difference in what would earn marks in the case study exam because it's always about answering the question again i thought that sentence was that uh, sentence was very good um you know because answer the question not a different question right and the, the students who have got through the strategic case study are generally they will i mean you get there is some luck involved as well okay so i won't say there is no luck involved because at times you prepare and you prepare and you know at that day something happens it doesn't go through pretty well so that's a luck but most of the time the students who consistently attend the classes and then they consistently do the homework the questions prepare they have passed okay they have passed the exam so please bear that in mind i know each one of us have a lot of work uh, personal as well as office work and things like that so there's a lot of pressure but if you're serious about it you need to put in time and in this case it's not a huge amount of time because duration because what we're talking about is four to five weeks right uh, need to worry about competencies as a good answer will hit the competencies right it needs to hit the competencies so when you're answering always have those competencies in mind don't forget it um, so strategic questions will ask for a different approach from an operational question right the strategic questions are more complex sometimes you you go in uh, and you say oh what is this question all about i could have done it without any studying not really because they're looking for a particular structure and the theories right you don't see it there they're not asking you for theories a particular theory they don't ask you for all those things they're expecting you to apply it okay so again be conscious of that now here we go this is what our examiner had to say ethics was one poor area so candidates could not name the ethical principles apply them or even recognize an ethical issue right so we should do quite a bit of ethical um, questions in in order to make sure all of us are very very familiar we understand the principles and so on finance where the lack of ability was surprising he says right so that's strange um the people i think who've got quite a lot of exemptions be careful when you're attempting this section because maybe you have forgotten your financing um the the theories and things like that so you need to brush up on your f3 okay uh, when we do questions in f3 now kumar will be covering those questions in uh, in a lot in f3 it's a very good lecturer very good um, in this particular area that's why he he works with me in this subject so he can bring in a lot of insight Andrew, um yeah, the question. third one uh, yeah. yeah sorry about the finance part you know in in the version of the exam that i got it was the awfully questions mm -hmm did not approach anything related to finance whatsoever. Um, right. There was no, no, no ways to even actually mention anything technical in, in that perspective. How do we do in such a case? Right. Uh, so in that case, if there is nothing in nothing, I don't. So the other aspect of it that you need to consider is that you will have um, 
one second there is a couple of other students joining i just want to send them a message okay just give me a second please so in that case um what you might be now one thing is they may have given finance calculations and you know it for you to interpret etc okay but there would even if it's not there right if it is appropriate you can bring in finance aspects to it i'm not saying you should not right so look at it and see if it is required as in they may have not stated it there in the question but ask yourself do i have to talk about anything in finance here again when we come to questions we'll look into it because he's mentioned finance and now after all our exam is in accounting right management accounting so look at opportunities where we can use some management accounting jargon some management accounting theories and so on um most candidates answering the variance attempted all three sections but some missed out on specific parts right this is what i mentioned that uh people have actually missed completely right um so in this case the examiner is uh not able to give you marks right this is a bit of a problem right uh so be careful identify that um you know what the questions are and whether you have answered all of them okay because again you're missing an opportunity to score marks yeah something positive it was also good to see most candidates tried to use relevant models and did not produce a list of inappropriate models right so it's good positive right um so that's that's a good thing and of course your time management is of essence yeah um now let us go into your case study yeah let me bring that up So this is where I'm expecting a lot of interactions uh, from the students, right? From you guys. Now let me share this. Right. So let me ask from um, some of you. When you read the first paragraph, what do you think it is all about? what do you think what type of questions do you think that you can expect because it's a consulting company there could be some ethical questions around it mhm mm yes anyone else i think csr is the important part that is okay so one is ethical one is csr what else i think you'll have a stakeholder a big stakeholder issue you know in the uh you know relating to various uh, entities uh, be it government all stakeholders basically mm -hmm. and also if i look at the role that you're gonna you're playing right you're a senior manager who works in the finance function for alternate energy consulting you report directly to the board advice on special projects and strategic matters so really you are specifically looking at special projects and strategic matters right um and not in the operational sense yeah that's that is your role so that is important for you to understand uh the kind of role that you're playing right so they are going into the consulting space 
and advice on construction operation of wind farms okay construction and operation of wind farms if you look at this first part the next paragraph you're a consultant what are the risks that might be there i can see something here anyone else can pick up because they're saying your construction and operation of wind farms any views swati what about you Uh, maybe I what see. Is kind yeah, of like a, a lawsuit, you know, somebody, for example. Exactly, Roland. Thank you. Yes, or that's a, what or, I was. Or a, yes. Or a powerful group of, you know, ecological group, and they're just basically suing the company. And it's correct. Yeah. Right. That is exactly right. So, um, so this is where I said, mentioned to you. You guys need to read between the lines and think. Of, this is where your imagination. You know, you need to use your imagination a little bit and say, because it is not just reading it, this lawsuit story is not there. Okay. So then you look at, well, what else can happen? Construction operation. You're an advisor. You're a consultant. What if you consult incorrectly, right? What if you give incorrect advice? What's going to happen, right? So there can be a lawsuit then similarly there's another area that you need to consider you need to hire when it comes to hiring people you need to hire very good very skill, highly skilled people right because something goes wrong in this construction and operation the liability comes in directly to you as a company right how do you mitigate it is through your very good hiring practices right it, it is critical now they are actually going into their partnering with universities existing universities in the in the vicinity as well which is good so they are in a they are in a in a position to get some of the best candidates for them right um so they have they look at three areas, engineering, PR, and legal, right? And they operate as separate divisions. And however, they offer one-stop shop, right, for their services to the clients. Now, um, how, if they operate as separate divisions, anything else that you guys can think about it? anything else they're working as they're operating as separate divisions so what are the complexities consequences that you will face here and it could be that all these three departments they are not aligned to each other or working together with each other that could be either because of some ego issues or lack of proper policies and procedures on how to work in tandem yeah that's good one what else anything else and the cultures might be different as well right because you're looking at distinctly different the legal bodies the engineering and PR right different cultures working together three different cultures what else I hope you're making notes what else what about transfer pricing? Opportunity for transfer pricing as well, right? So there is a opportunity for transfer pricing here. So what are some of the consequences of transfer pricing? Can we do a quick one-liner on transfer pricing? I have a limited understanding of it. Right, anyone there who, who knows transfer pricing? Swati, what about you? 
Very strange surprising. So transfer pricing is quite an important thing because as companies we can do a lot of uh, manipulation with this transfer pricing, right? That's the reason. So one company is um, giving um, different source, different um, pricing to another area, okay? Uh, it could be for multiple reasons. Now, they're offering three main services. They operate as separate divisions. So within intercompany, we can have transfer pricing, different transfer pricing as well. By doing that, now in this case, it is not so, um, you know, I don't think they'll get into too many issues from a taxation point of view, but unless you're working in different parts of the world right uh, but the issue here is you can get into a situation where one division is um, you know operating in a very inefficient manner in a not very competitive manner to the whole organization so if as engineering I'm putting a 20 percent uh, markup on what I'm doing and um, and the legal so f let, let's go into legal legal is easy so engineering wants legal services so uh, what I will do is basically the legal will increase it 20% right um, and then the problem is if I look at uh, the marketing the market itself the market might be very competitive right but because of this 20 percent additional cost that the legal is applying to their cost engineering has to bear that cost and then pass it on to the client which may not be very competitive right so issues may like that may happen as well they've not stated that but it may be there in one of the questions. Now, let's go to the, the next paragraph, right? What are they talking about there? Any, can somebody summarize this? Jake, any, can you summarize this, this particular one? So what they're looking at here is a different, you know, going through the processes, you can see there are different um, authorities that are involved in this whole activity, right? So again, now you need to understand for each and, and every activity, uh, there would be certain um, stakeholders who are very important, very influential, right? And you will need to manage them accordingly. So, for example, if you're starting, if you're thinking of starting a project, right, um, and that particular project is going to kickstart, let's say, in eight months' time or nine months' time, there might be a lot of preparational activities that you need to do. However, one of the key things you may need to uh, look into and understand is who are the key stakeholders because you may need to engage them well in advance, right? Uh, so that's another uh, big thing that you need to consider. So one second, please. Jake, anything else? I can see that you have, um, you're able to talk now. Is there anything else that you want to add? Hello? Yeah, yes, Jake, oh, okay. I can hear you. Uh, I think my mic my, 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 my was uh, mute. Yeah, so do you want to add um, anything there? Just a minute. Yeah. Well, uh, well, they do su suitable suitability, accessibility, feasibility analysis, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. so um, 
Yeah, it's weird hearing hearing my voice. Oh, you're right. Just you, a can, you can hear you. The echo is it? Right. Is there anybody else who wants to add? Yeah. Uh, we can do here a pastel analysis uh -huh. because there is a conflict of interest between different players mm -hmm. like uh, the government, uh, the shareholders uh, and other stakeholders like local residents and yeah. all. Yeah. 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 Correct. And one, one other con thing that you need to consider here is, um, you know, I, I, is the government themselves right so yeah yeah go on yeah Prabhen. no it is okay yeah so yeah it is okay one of the very interesting things uh and i i had a lecture to some nigerian students once and what they mentioned to me was you know they have an issue when the governments are about to change or going into you know a new government comes in they said you know it takes us so long to get approval for a particular project from one government and by the time we start or you know start start that project or just at the initial stage a new government comes in and that government stops everything or we need to go through another set of approvals right now this is a very interesting thing that they mention and which is applicable and you need to take that into consideration as well right i mean which state you know when it comes to the governments because there's a lot of support that is required from the governments right for this type of project so you need to understand and see you know from one government you may get a lot of support but are they in an election year are they about to get, uh, you know, thrown out, get a new uh, government to come in? So these are things that you need to also bring into uh, play and write about it because this is very practical, right? Again, that is part of stakeholder management. And if you are doing in a project like this, you may want to actually consider not only the current government, but also talk to the um, talk to the opposition as well you know get their blessings get them involved as well because uh, because it's important right there are certain quite a few groups that you need to um, consider right now then going going through we look at it was founded in 2000 by three engineering lecturers right three lecturers um, the four three lecturers and then you say the four founders are still with the company and sit on the board of directors they each contributed 25 percent of the equity when it was first created each still owns significant proportion of the company's issued shares right so um our annual revenue has increased each year right they're still based in the same city and where the founders met um, and the company has grown organically, right? It has a passion for innovation and approach, an innovative approach, right? Um, it has 90 professional staff and 34 support staff, and it has a matrix structure. And of course, there's an account manager that looks after each of the primary um, accounts in the business. Now, very interesting this this part of it what sort of a culture do you think they have what is the culture of the company it's a centralized uh, management uh, company everything is centralized in one institution uh, centralized what else and also matrix organization matrix yes yeah it's innovative right it's an innovative organization because this th organization thrives in innovation if you don't come up with something new it'll die right so in order to get in innovative culture what is what sort of a culture do you think that you need to have let's look at google very innovative company 
What do you think? So when it comes to basically they look at professionals, so mainly professionals that they need, high skilled people, right? Highly skilled people. And if it is highly skilled, then generally what sort of a structure do you have? A tall structure or a flat structure? I think it's a more of a flat structure, whereas in this particular company, uh, I think everyone is somehow reporting to Luke. Yeah. So, so that I don't know. That it is, could be it a is a flat structure, you're correct, because generally, if it may become a tall structure when you have to, it, when, the, when the teams are not highly skilled, this is highly skilled professionals who are here, right? Um, and then you have, um, you need to have a very open culture as well because the, the professionals need to come up with very innovative ideas, right? Very, very innovative ideas they need to come up with. They need to uh, be able to imagine things and work with new technology. So in order to do that, you have to be quite, think about things in a very free and free manner right you can't have restrictions yeah and what about the support staff so if I take a percentage right of the number of support staff that they've got right what's the percentage like nearly 40 percent right They're saying uh, the center has now 90 professional staff and 34 support staff, right? So basically, we are looking at 40% support staff. Now, why did I look at that? The reason is if I want to scale up, who do I need? Is it support staff or professional staff? What is required more? Yes, we need more professional staff, right? Because they are the ones who are... Now, remember, I'm still... These, these guys are still in the same place, same location. I want to move out. And maybe I want to go into different countries, right? And then I need my professional staff to go and work in different parts of the world. And maybe even from there, we, we bring in new staff. But then if, if we have to grow, I can't have 40% of my staff growing in order to support, right? If I grow my professional staff, double it, I can't have, double my support staff. What would I do for that? Sourcing. Sorry? Outsourcing. One is outsourcing, another way? part-time consultants okay but another one would be automating right working uh, online online you know working across teams across country using you know skype and cisco webex and stuff like that and a lot of automations yeah so basically what we're looking at is a lot of automation that i want to bring in and then look at also there are certain things you look at a shared service concept as well right so that's the kind of thing I'm looking at in order for me to grow yeah this is what I'm looking at now let's go to the next one chart that gives you a view of how this org chart is and who is reporting to whom and then you're looking at um, you know engineering legal PR separate divisions then you have an account manager so uh, this is an interesting thing and um, then they say finance staff including you you will go into work with Fiona's team right and then you have separately sales marketing staff as well right um, anything here that jumps at you when you look at this org chart anything here
okay no chairman okay uh, no nets yeah yes now my one of the main things would be corporate governance yeah corporate governance and we will look at NEDs, non-executive directors. It's not stated here, right? It's not given here. Maybe it will come in the unseen, not sure. But this is a question mark for us, okay? This is a question mark because it's not there so far. Let's go down. Um, anything about the AEN's founders? Is there anything that you want to say? Anything that... Uh, let's say first three paragraphs anyone wants to comment I mean, the, the first thing was that none of them were having a real-time experience uh, when they started the business however by being a lecturer and less of a practical experience they still prove the company uh, uh, proved by making it very successful so I don't know after 16 20 years if their initial experience was still is still important now or not mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. good good observation so when they started off they were lecturers and they they did it quite well but that's also at the infancy right because um, so they also let me see the chat because Jake is uh, is telling us some interesting facts there so what we're also mentioning is that um, even the industry was at a an infancy stage so Nikhil you're right to say well now this infancy stage is no more right uh, there's it's just a lot of competition there's a lot of other products uh, that's come out as well so are they the right people to still run the company do we need others to come into this space is is a question right um so founders formally in, incorporated a yen in 2000 uh, they have very good the product is very good and as a result uh, they have got a lot of um, recommendations, so word of mouth, and that's the reason why they've got, um, you know, the growth in their business. Yeah, so they are giving a very good service to their customers, right? Um, and let's look at the media interest, right? So there is a lot of media interest as well, uh, which attracts, you know, which gives good publicity. Now, then we talk about alternate energy, right? Um, then there's also talk about nuclear power point, power, right? Why do you think nuclear power is not, is not favored? Anything that you guys know about? It is, I think because of the risk you know, associated with nuclear power, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's from the explosion side or also from the cleanliness side, you know, what to get rid to once you have, uh, you know, processed the material. Yes. It's difficult to, to to get rid of afterwards. Yeah. So. Secondly, so that uh, the nuclear power first of all to set up a this to create a setup, it is super costly. Yeah. And it is not suitable for the small cities or you know some, for the small needs. Yes, and also we saw the Fukushima, that's what Jay was saying, uh, you know, disasters, uh, you know, what happens when when something like this, that takes place. So um, nuclear is not something that they want to go towards, right? Um, it's not sustainable. Um, various international treaties have led to most countries agreeing to reduce their use of fossil fuel as a matter of, matter of some urgency right and you can see this um about fossil uh, you know countries where they say they and most of the developed countries are the ones who use or consume most amount of fossil fuel and they're bringing in a lot of um a lot of a lot of uh rules regulations policies in order to reduce it so what is an opportunity there? Can you see an opportunity for AEN there? 
What is the opportunity? Any ideas? Sorry. Which page you are referring to? I'm sorry. So by more countries, you, see, you can see various international treaties have led to most countries agreeing to reduce their fossil fuel. Right. So do you see an opportunity there for AN? For this company? Yes, Roland, thank you. So that's what international um, expansion right this gives the opportunity for this company to go in international right so that is a very good space that we are in and also we have experts we started in 2000 now we are in 2016 right so 16 years we've worked we've got very successful projects so we are in a position to go into so many countries to offer consultancy services, work with them on different projects, right? So this is a good position that we are in. But what do you think the owners, the founders would be like? What do you think their, their views would be? Any views? You guys are very quiet today. Should they want to? Should they want to take the risk of expanding to a new country mm -hmm. where they are not much exposed? Mm -hmm. Plus, they have been growing here for the last sixteen years, mm -hmm. and there, there is a point that only nine percent is used by alternative energy mm -hmm. in this country. Mm -hmm. So. Do they want to explore a new country or do they want to expand in the same country? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good observation that, because 9%, yeah. however, but you can also look at are there any other countries who are really going gung-ho and saying, right, I want to expand and really invest and go into this type of, um, this type of energy, alternate energy? right maybe this particular country is a bit reluctant or you know slow in moving towards it right and but we have been working very hard in this space and been uh, have got a lot of uh, experience but maybe there are other countries where we can expand where there is a lot of interest from the government and the people to go into this alternate energy however if you look at the founders look at them they are lecturers former lecturers it's their hometown they have been i mean they've grown organically so if you're looking at expanding there might be some resistance right there might be some resistance to this expansion right do you see that Do you see any resistance because of the kind of characteristics of the owners and the people who've been there, right? And they have hired people around from their uh, own base as well. So they, they're in their own city. So there might be a lot of uh, reluctance to move around, even though they are quite successful, right? Even though there are opportunities, it might be um, restricted because of the new, new uh, not wanting to move to the new spaces, right? So they talk a little bit about what is alternate energy. Uh, wind, wave, solar, tide, biofuels tend to be renewable either because they capture energy from natural phenomena such as the wind or sunlight or because they rely on organic material that can be replaced through regrowth once consumed, right? So these energies sources are less dangerous in ter terms of waste and emission, right? Again, positive. Um, so what about the industry areas, right? Breezeland was in the state of relative infancy so you can see when they started off where were they right steady growth right steady growth so from this 
point how would you look at uh, this company and say uh, what are the opportunities that are there uh, if I look at Ansoft matrix now uh, how would I use Ansoft matrix if I look at this industry if I look at the growth how can I use Ansoft here I mean before before just we dwell into one soft because i personally have never seen it but one thing is very clear that this company is a perfect perfect candidate for some big company who can come and take over it just because they have a strong regional presence and expert in only one technology so someone wants to someone is an industry player super giant in solar and they want to diversify so they can just do an organic growth by acquiring this company yeah, very good. Very good observation, Nikhil. Um, anyone else? Anyone else? This type of uh, acquisition happened in, um, in one of the companies I worked and that was with, um, it was an um, insurance company. So that was called um, MBF in Australia and they had a huge brand they were very well known in australia but not anywhere else but then of course bupa was there which is uh, worldwide and bupa was not known in australia at all it had a very small presence in australia and what they did was they were looking for uh, an acquisition right in australia new zealand market and of course um, this is what they did uh, the presence in Australia was very small, but then worldwide they were big giants. They went and acquired um, MBF, right? So, uh, to your point, Nikhil, this it's a very much a, a something that can happen. Uh, a, a takeover can happen as well. Anyone else? Actually, I can see the current strategy is the existing product in the existing market. And th that's the current situation. Sorry, I can't hear you. Regarding Ansof uh, metrics, yeah. they are in the uh, they have existing product in the existing market. Yes. Yeah. So okay. what you're saying is go into market penetration. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. So go into market penetration, and especially there is opportunity. It seems like you know the people didn't know about it that much 16 years ago, and now it's it's um, there is a lot of know-how. There's a lot of publicity, and depends on the kind of support that is given by the government and the universities and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And there then we can um, work and work in that particular. Um, particular area itself and do a market penetration for that maybe we need to go into other regions as well because they are currently working only in one area yeah so that's something that we need to consider so um, and you yeah. sorry quick, uh, quick question here I've kind of read it the the other way you know of assuming that they are already existing in this market and they have an existing product which they've been performing for the past 15 years mm -hmm. So now the only way is to basically either go abroad, which is, you know, make market development, mm -hmm. so existing product in a new market, mm -hmm. or in the existing market, develop some new products. For instance, today they've been focusing primarily on windmills, yeah. but there are other alternative energies where they are still weak themselves. They have done some consulting in it, but not that much according to the pre-scene. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like tidal waves or any solar power or anything else, mm -hmm. they could maybe mm -hmm. probably emphasize this area. So within their existing market, maybe develop that or develop windmills in other foreign markets. Mm -hmm. I, so I saw those two strategies being the next step. Mm -hmm. I did not see market penetration as, as, as the option here because I've, you know, I'm assuming mm -hmm. they've been already milking this market for 15 years. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. So that is it depends on the situation right of the of what the examiner would put in front of you it depends right because it will say it's purely how it is put in front of you you can argue your case either way 
but then you can use structure so you can use the framework of ANSOF and then um, argue and justify your your case for or against and and give provide the reasoning as well so that leads me to a question now because um, I was thinking of giving you the question a little bit later but what I'm going to do is to give you the question right away because you came up uh, Ronald with the question that I had in mind okay so I'm gonna st stop at this point we've got so we've got um, 20 minutes to go what I'm gonna give you is 10 minutes to do um, an answer sketch right and I want you to share um, so I will ask some of you to share your screen with me with us basically and tell how you're going how you structured your answer right um, so give me a second I'm gonna stop sharing right now So I think you can see my screen now um, and it's about um, a scenario that that's taken place. I want you to take 10 minutes, write the answer to this. This is an answer plan, just a structure that I'm looking for and um, I will stop you in 10 minutes, okay? So I'm going to put myself on mute. Hi, I think we've um, finished the 10 minutes just now. So what I would ask you guys is one of you to share your answers with me. Can I share my screen? Yeah, sure, go for it. Uh, I, I don't have, I'm using this all WebEx on my mobile. So I all right, it's okay, share. that's fine. So the people who can, can, um, share the screen thank you yeah. can you see my screen? yeah we can yes yeah. actually I put a uh, quick introduction yes that is a, a very good step from the board to think in investing in international market mm -hmm. and I can see it's a kind of uh, diversification new products which is a wave power and the new market which is the new market which is Denmark mm -hmm. and we have to apply the surf, uh, surface model mm -hmm. uh, and we have to check I if that idea is suitable with our uh, strategy or not, uh, mm -hmm. visible or not all of the all of that uh, mm -hmm. approach then that investment has the pros and the cons. The pros is the synergy, mm -hmm. and also this investment will increase revenue, future cash flow, and accordingly the share price. Yep. The cons is no experience in wave power, uh, strategic risk, no international experience. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, in, uh, investing in Denmark, uh, we may have a foreign exchange risk. Yes. It is a big investment, and also they don't have experience in Denmark market. Right. Right. Anything else? 
that's all. Yeah. Right. Okay. Anyone else? Can I just speak? Yeah, my point sure. Yeah, go so for it. Yeah. That you can evaluate. Okay. So the first is the heading approach in evaluating impact on stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Firstly, AEN objective is to create sustainable energy for the world. The, and this is coming from the mission and mission statement and the strategy statement. Yeah. Page, page, page number ten of yeah. the CPC. Yeah. Good. For Firstly, AEN objective is to create sustainable energy for the world by entering a new market with strategic player meets our objective and reduces the risk of entering into new market by sharing the risk with XYZ. Mm -hmm. Secondly, AEN objective is to increase the use of alternatives to fossil fuels. Partnering with XYZ for wave power is in line with the company's strategic objective. Mm -hmm. Third. We need to understand the financial implication to make sure that it this particular project or strategic partnership creates wealth for its shareholders. Yeah. So these were the three points I could come up with. Okay. I Anyone else? Because I have a, an answer, so I want to show that to you. Before I do that, I just want to ask someone else. All right. Okay, Jai. It's all right. Someone else. Roland, what about you? Okay, okay I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll share my answer. Just yeah, yeah. A second. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. So, just uh, three points on the pros. Fulfill the expansion overseas. Yep. You know, it has a big potential. So, Natural progression for the Ansoft matrix, which is going into new products, which is renewable energy other than windmills. And then joining with a company rather than taking all the risk on our own. So yeah. rather than putting it all, yeah. On the con side, the risks are high because we're trying to do two things at the same time. So expand into new products and into new markets at the same time. Correct. Which is more of a diversification. Yes. And this is risky. It could be costly financially and we might need to borrow money to be able to afford this expansion. And then fourth one is the team's compatibility might be an issue, you know, different cultures, different teams. Mm -hmm. And then also knowledge of the Danish market, you know, in terms of laws, customs, cultures and stuff like that are different. So these yeah. are on the con side. Yeah. That's about it. Okay. Anybody yeah. else who've yeah. got anything, anything extra? Uh, only thing is like, we need to have a look at the pestle analysis. Yeah. Because they're entering a new market altogether yeah and uh, totally a different country altogether yeah and this entirely comes under the business skills mm -hmm. other three are not as in the like finance part no explanations are given mm -hmm. okay. uh, leadership mm -hmm. yeah we need to find out one particular person who should be able to take forward or discuss with the Denmark team mm -hmm. people skills yeah it is about getting getting along with a group from the Denmark company. Mm -hmm. Majorly, this looks into the business skills of the four pillars. Right. Okay, good. Now I'm going to go back to the question, okay, and see if um, whether we have answered everything, what they've asked. So, board is considering a strategic investment with a company in Denmark. This is a project to invest in wave power. So I think you guys, all of you have mentioned uh, wave power is something new. So new product, new market. Should AEN together with XYZ company invest in this new project, the board is divided over the proposal if we should proceed with it. Outline the approach that we should take in an evaluating the impact of this project to both internal and external stakeholders. I didn't see this in any one of the answers. Right now, you can see um, what the examiner says. Right, you guys have really nicely done the first part of it. Second part, I've just chucked it in, and you guys missed it. Now, I want to go back to uh, a question and an answer. Right, let me stop sharing my screen for a second.
So one second. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen with you now again. This is the variant um, in the last exam, okay? So I adapted this question just now to from this particular variant. Now, what they're asking is something very similar, okay? They're saying it doesn't matter about the scenario. They're saying they want to invest, right? Um, something big in a particular project in a virtual reality right um, it's gonna be a very expensive thing um, so the board is divided over the proposal to proceed with this ride some members believe that it will be too expensive and the returns are uncertain whilst others argue that we can't afford not to make such a major investment to an extent, the two sides are divided over the poten potential impact of this project on the short term and in the long term future performance of Dream Park. I need your thoughts on the question of whether or not Dream Park should make this strategic investment. I also need you to outline the approach we should take to evaluating the impact of this project on both internal and external stakeholders right this is exactly I've adapted you can see I've adapted from this particular question now let us close this let's look at the answer there are arguments for and against the proposal so I think most of you got this for and against the proposal you were uh, you were talking about this right um, so then 